Okay. Perfect. Um, so, Shanaz, if you're available, I think uh, over right. to you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My, my name is Shanaz Bangi. I'm the head of the High Net Worth and Business Development at Indue Risk Services. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for, for your time. Um, and thank you, Brad, Vira, for such an informative and interesting presentation. My question to all of you online is, do you have appropriate insurance to mitigate the risks that, that we are all aware of and Brad has highlighted today? Thank you, Jeanette, for your presentation. So what to expect next after this webinar, you will get your CPD uh, certificates emailed to you. Jeanette will be in touch with you to discuss medical malpractice product. And if you need, if you have any further insurance uh, needs from, in, from a personal line or even from a commercial perspective, the Indue Elite Account Executives are available 24 seven to assist you with, 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 your, with your needs. And once again, thank you very much for, for your attendance tonight. Be safe and have a fabulous evening. Thank you. He's a qualified risk manager practitioner and a chartered insurance practitioner. Um, Peter is currently the president of FIA and the CEO of Inway Risk Services. Without further ado, Peter, over to you. Thank you and good evening, honored guests. Thank you for giving up your time to share with us. Uh, my name is Peter Elliott and I am the CEO of Inway. It's an honor and privilege to welcome you to this evening's webinar. In this time of greater connectivity and information sharing and accessibility, ironically brought about and emphasized by the increased physical isolation of COVID-19, it is apparent to us that you know, the medical practitioner's professional liability exposures are changing and, and rather rapidly. So our two presenters this evening will touch on firstly, medical malpractice, legal liability insurance, what does it entail? And then the, the second part will be how this greater connectivity and accessibility of medical records and sharing can actually increase the liability exposure of medical practitioners. So thank you for giving of your time to be with us. We trust you'll find value in our session this evening. And without further ado, I'll reintroduce you to Jeanette de Villiers of MC de Villiers Brokers, who are the specialist medical malpractice insurance partners of various services. Over to you, Jeanette. Thank you, Peter. Um, Michael, can I share screen, please? Yeah, you should have the ability to do so. Just, um, okay. just try. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Not at this stage, Jeanette. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on a second. You're going to have to give me a second. Sorry. Do you have any background music while we wait, Jeanette? No, I don't. <laughs> we can dance to the music of your uh, Northern Lights in the background. There we go. There we are. It's starting. There we are. Okay. Thank you, you very may. much for your patience. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, I just let me just put it onto full screen, please. There we go. Uh, just uh, um, I just like to introduce myself to you. I'm Jeanette De Villiers. I've got 20 years of experience in the medical arena, including uh, registered medical funds and primary healthcare. My core focus is uh, to offer market-leading medical malpractice solutions, and I'm absolutely passionate about the industry. And I am known. Um, I'm known for being the passionate and knowledge research in the industry. Why would you engage with MC De Villiers Brokers and Inware? We're independent, we're responsible, we're accredited intermediaries. We, have, uh, we give our clients advice on the most appropriate solution, addressing your specific requirements. We attain competitive quotations and we offer you superior service at all times. How would you go about choosing a medical malpractice cover for your practice that is suitable? Um, you would need to look for a, a reliable underwriter, a fund that's reinsured appropriately. It needs to be, the fund needs to be compliant with the FECA regulation. The terms and conditions should meet your requirements and the premiums should be sustainable and have a favorable increase on an annualized basis. Our foundation is based on sound relationships 
treating our customers fairly, appropriate solutions, transparency at all times. We have the expertise and consistent service. As a professional, you need to understand how the medical malpractice works and to be able to support your insurer and the lawyer should a claim ever arise to ensure that you have absolute peace of mind. There are two things that are certain, and that is death and taxes. But I'd like to share a third aspect. Uh, the practice of medical law long enough, you are sure to be involved in a medical malpractice lawsuit case or inquiry. When you are faced with a medical malpractice um, case, there is no black and white. It's normally gray. That's because everything is subject to interpretation, the law, arguments, and facts. The integral aspect that you have in your practice is the physician-patient relationship, establishing care, medical records, and informed consents. These are some of, because of these integral parts, it's important that MC Davila's brokers can assist you in reviewing your cover on an annualized basis. We ensure your pol policy remains competitive. We have sufficient medical malpractice cover in place. We confirm that there are no material changes, and if there are, we amend your policy accordingly. We review your current indemnity, including the extensions and exclusions, evaluate the excesses that have been offered to you, confirm whether you are VAT registered, and if you are, to ensure that you get your VAT benefit back, confirm your extended reporting period and your knowledge of that. Mm -hmm. The additional services we offer you is access to minimum healthcare records, oh access to informed consents, access to the CPD portal, easy claims notification and tracking, and best practice management in partnership with SA Medical Specialists that offer you a free plagiarism check and free web website hosting for a period of 24 months. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Michael, pleased to introduce Dr. Brad Barra, and I hope you really enjoy the session. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, Doctors, as I said uh, a little bit earlier, I'm very, very pleased to be able to announce that Dr. Bayer will be ad addressing us this evening on, on social media risks. Um, I, Brad and I uh, uh, go back approximately three years. Sorry, uh, I, can, I can hear someone else's microphone. Um, sorry, Brad and I go back approximately three years now, and I've, I've had the pleasure of hearing him speak on a number of uh, very informative topics. Um, I'm sure that you guys are going to be in capable hands. Just some ground rules for the for the for the talk. Please, will you use the chat bar on the right hand side to address any questions to the speakers? And please, will you also ensure that you keep your 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 uh, microphone muted throughout the presentation, just so that there's no background noise for for the for the talk. Um, in terms of the CPD, everyone will be accredited with one CPD point for this for attending this conference, um, and those will be distributed through Indwe slash MC De Villiers um, a couple of days after the presentation. So, without further ado, Brad, over to you. Michael, just uh, just this, uh, we've just had something thank on the you. chat. And say. Jeanette, thank you, and Peter, thank you. It's still unusual, Lord. Uh, uh, Brad, yeah, just for one second, uh, Brad, the, they said there's on the chat box said that there is uh, the sound is there's not great. Yeah. Yeah, just you know. yeah, I just did. Um, it's mute. Um, stop video. Komeza, can you mute your microphone, please? All right, Brad, I've muted everyone. You should be good to go. Okay, I'm, I'm not able for some reason to, to get the presentation up as we speak. So give me a second and we should all get started. There's Nothing like a bit of technology to reinforce why um, life is a challenge in our new environment. So, hi to everyone and, and welcome. It's very nice to be here. It's early in the year for our CPD points. And it's also early year for this journey of, um, think of my life over the last year. For the five to 15 years before this, I used to talk face to face. For the last 11 months, in fact, since the 15th of March, 
majority of our conversations have been this kind of a conversation. And, and it's different. It's a different style. It's a different way of speaking. It's a different way of engaging. So I do hope the sound is better. If there's something that you need, use the chat box and, and let's, I will try and be as responsive as I can. So I'll, I'll check it on a regular basis. The purpose of today as we go through is to start talking about um, social media and social media risk. And one of the things that you'll notice is that technology has fundamentally changed the way we do what we do. I've only been in practice now since 1996, so I'm still figuring it out. But um, on my desk, I've got the Merck manual from 1899, and I've got the last Merck manual that I bought from 1999. And nowadays we've got the World Wide Web and electronic access, and we can ask Siri to find something for us and a, and a host of technology tools that gives us unprecedented access to information that we never used to have. I used to, when I learned, and, and I say this as context to the technology and, and, and the digital world we live in, but I used to have a Mercury Sphygma that you'd open it up, it was about a foot long, and then I had my stethoscope in and you'd, you, you'd pump it up. And now the unit I have is an EVAN unit and there's many others that does the map and the SPO2 and the pulse and the tracer all in one. Now, what it also does in, 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 in this case is it takes that information and it digitally sends it to my electronic medical record or to somebody else's record. If you're in a hospital, it can be um, transformed or transmitted using your USP or on a Wi-Fi system. So the world we live in is different. The way we do telehealth and telemedicine is unprecedented and it's changed the way we do our practice to the point, and we'll talk about this later, that you can now re uh, provide information, require consent, and get a digital signature of consent all remotely, things that a, a couple of years ago we didn't do. But it also allows the digital world to make our personal data almost instantly accessible. Now, what is our personal data and why does it relate to social media? Your name, your age, your demographic, your location, your state of health, your IP address are all considered to be special data or personal data. And under the new Poppy Act and under the Electronic Communications and Transmission Act, how we look after that data, how we share that data, and how we're potentially held accountable for that data is very, very powerful. And it's not something we learned. It's, it's not something that you can go and you can pick up a manual that tells you your clinical practice needs to shift in the following ways. So a lot of today's presentation is going to be around what does the digital world mean for us? And fundamentally, how do we practice in a socially connected world? Because we're connected now in a way that we've never been connected before. The concept of, if, if I said to you, imagine back March 2019, would you do your CPD online sitting in your bedroom or sitting in your lounge or, or, or sitting like we are in multiple provinces, the answer would have been probably no. One of the, the, the sessions that I did, I, I suffer from a, a, a lot of stress right now. And one of them is I used to do a CPD talk, used to take me 36 hours because I used to fly, for example, to Nelspreek. And I'd have to fly early in the morning, spend the day there, do the hour and a half or two hours in the evening, sleep over there, take the midday flight back. And so now I walk downstairs, I switch on the laptop and off we go down the journey. And I can see patients the same way. And often we, we, have, we have partners who say to us, well, I'm a cardiologist. I can't use telemedicine and telehealth in the same way that a general practitioner might. But the world has certainly changed. And, and one of the things as we talk about COVID, COVID is, is, is pitched as the first pandemic with its own media campaign. We go back, to, to Zika, or we go back to MERS, or we talk about avian flu, or we talk about SARS. The, the public, the general public awareness was fundamentally different. The pressure in those um, environments to use specific treatment regimes or off-label medicines was completely different to how it is now. Now, I remember when, when I started in practice, the internet wasn't as fundamentally accessible as it is now. And people would come in and and, and they would say, well, you know, I've, I've gone online and I've done my research. Now, I've done the research. 
this is what I think is wrong with me. This is the kind of investigations that I'd like you to script for me and motivate for my, my third party funder so that I can get the treatment that I think I need. And in a practitioner's room the other day, they said, my medical degree trumps your Dr. Google. So we've, we've changed a little bit. And, and that's the purpose of, of, of talking about social media. So by orientation, when we talk about social media, we need to recognize that all user-generated content, whether it is social networks or internet forums or personal blogs, is considered by the HPCSA as social media in the context of governing our practices. And that is in, in um, the ethical guidelines, it's booklet 16. For those of you that have read the booklet and you know it well, it's page 304 onwards. If you haven't read the booklet, it's page 304 onwards. And one of the things that's worth doing is just going through and downloading all 17 um, ethical guidelines so that you've got the reference to it. When we started doing this a, a little while ago, we found that, and that um, more than 90%, and, and this is the Quantia MD's research, but there's a significant amount, probably by far the majority of people are using um, social media, not only for their personal activities, but when this study was done, uh, roughly 65% were using uh, social media sites for professional reasons. I would posit now that probably close to 80% of people are using at least one or more social media sites for, um, for the purposes of uh, diagnosis or for the purpose of care or for the purpose of um, communication. So just as a moment of self-reflection here, I'd like to know from you, firstly, if you look at the screen, you'll recognize you Yahoo, recognize some of you, because it says Yahoo. Some of you will notice Google, you'll notice LinkedIn, you might notice Facebook, you'll notice Twitter. You'll notice that, that the last presidential campaign was largely argued on Twitter to the point that um, the issue of free speech came in. You'll see that uh, YouTube is there, so there's a lot going on, and, and, and this is already dated. Think and others um, start to change the way things come in. And, and I had a patient come in last week, and she had a dislocated patella and some significant injuries. I said, what happened? I asked her parents. They said, no, she was making a TikTok video and fell off the bed and dislocated her patella. So not only are we seeing the social media risks, but we're seeing patients present as a consequence of, of what they're doing. When we talk about tools and electronic platforms, we're looking at things like your opinions, your input, all forms part of social media. That includes our networks. So Facebook, WhatsApp, and LinkedIn. Now, how many of you have a practice site or a personal site that includes Facebook? Maybe you have a Facebook site because you have a social Facebook site, but you don't, it's very difficult nowadays to separate your social persona from your professional persona. You may have a Twitter site, you may use WhatsApp, and if you're using WhatsApp, and I'll say it now, because I would imagine that the majority of you that have a smartphone who communicate with each other are using WhatsApp. My question would be, for your patient-related conversations, are you using WhatsApp or are you using WhatsApp business? because the inference changes depending on which one you're using. Are you using LinkedIn? Because those are all social networks. Then you've got content sharing platforms like YouTube and Instagram. And you may be using YouTube as a informed consent basis for a procedure where you're saying to somebody, we're going to do an ACL repair, or we're going to do a stent, or we're going to uh, do an imaging um, approach in one shape or another. Here's your link to a YouTube video for you to be able to watch it. Then of course, you've got the next component, which is your personal and, and, and professional blogs. And here you're looking at your emails, you're looking at um, your SMS communication, and to some extent also your WhatsApp communication, any electronic journals that you publish on, and anything that you're publishing anonymously falls into that. So do your internet discussion forums and your comment sections on websites. So this is covered in the HPCSA um, booklet, uh, section 3.2, you'll notice as I go through this with you, all of the commentary links back to a reference so that you're able to, um, to go back 
and challenge, ask questions and, and check it out. I see that our chat is relatively calm, so I'm hoping that um, I haven't terrified anyone yet. The goal is not to, but we, we'll see how it goes. So when we look at social media, we need to recognize that these internet-based tools give us tremendous access. They let us speak in real time. They, they, they let us often be able to connect either with a colleague and or with the patient with video where we can see where they are, we can see what they're doing, they can communicate with us and the, the value to that is remarkable. I've, I've worked in a, in a hospital environment where we could do um, cardiac assessments that we could send for interpretation to another country in another time zone for a real time interpretation and a second opinion. That's great. The value of social media is powerful, but there's also potential risks that come with this. Now, the clinical debates, and I use the COVID example as, as one, is the use of um, off-label medication. Now, some of that information is good quality. Some of it is questionable quality, and some of it is just poor misinformation. Filtering that out and then having to work with your, with your patients and sometimes with your colleagues to manage that is one of the challenges that social media presents because the information, sadly, often the misinformation travels faster than the good information. You've also got risks of, of damage to your professional image because one makes a statement in one context that is often heard or interpreted or represented in another context. Then it can take days, weeks, months, or years to undo that. And some examples of that we'll talk about later, um, but recognize that if there's a lawsuit against you in healthcare, on average, a litigation takes seven years to resolve. Now, seven years or three years for an HPCSA complaint is a significant amount of time to go to bed at night worrying about what's going to happen. Social media also increases the risks of, of, of patient privacy. It also, in certain instances, creates the provocation where your personal and professional boundary can uh, become a little bit blurry because you're starting to communicate in a way that creates either a, um, a more intimate relationship that sits adjacent to your therapeutic relationship and um, equally the use of certain um, licensing or, or, or legal exposures becomes relevant. And an example of this, just as we touch base, and we're going to go through this fairly fast because we've, we, I'd, I'd committed that we're done with enough time to ask a question or two. If you think about imaging in the past, you, if you were working in an orthopedic or a musculoskeletal or a, a, a general imaging practice, you would need to have had a, a, a viewing box. Then when from viewing boxes, you needed to have a desktop or a laptop that had software loaded onto it and you were given a CD. Now you're given a username and a password and you can go in and you search by patient name, by ID number, and sometimes, only sometimes, you have to designate whether you were the prescribing practitioner or not. Sometimes you can just get the patient's information and sometimes, you can get the information of a patient who wasn't your patient, who isn't actually even the patient that you're looking for because it's same or similar name and same or similar age. And I've had experiences where somebody's looked for a patient and they've typed in the name and it's a fairly common name and they, it's a 13 year old woman. And guess what? There were three of them with the same names and same surnames with different middle names, all with, a particular region that was imaged. Granted, they were in different provinces and different regions, but if you weren't paying attention, you could quite easily download the wrong information, the wrong image, the wrong report, send it to the right person and end up in a different, uh, a difficult position. So can, <laughs> can some of you remember when we used to have dial-up modems and it used to make pinging sounds? Nowadays, you've got one of these, whether it is a well-known brand or a less well-known brand, and um, you got to download faster than the other person because they come in often more prepared. And not only do you have to download fast, but you have to make sure that um, the information that you're sharing is often encrypted or protected and your devices are encrypted and protected. And I'll share that with you again later. So bear in mind when we start talking about 
social media. We're really talking about your conduct as a healthcare professional governed under the um, ethical guidelines booklets and the constitution and the National Health Act. So if you can't sleep, you start by reading the constitution, then you read the Bill of Rights, which is chapter two of the constitution. Then you read that in terms of the um, National Health Act, specifically, but not limited to section six and seven on informed consent and disclosure. Then you read that with the Health Professions Act, which gives the uh, empowerment to you registering as a professional. Then you read that with the ethical guidelines. Then you've got to read that with things like the Consumer Protection Act and the uh, Protection of, of um, Personal Information Act. So it becomes quite a big uh, project. For the purposes of this, in terms of your own conduct, I'm suggesting that you look at your general ethical guidelines and the booklet five, which is protecting and providing information because that's not only protecting and providing information to your patient, but it also includes how you protect information from hackers, from accidental or purposeful intrusion from a, a staff member or a colleague or an ex-colleague who has bad intentions, but also from third party payers and from uh, malware people. So what we know of is a case where a person was using um, pacemaker devices that had a particular electronic signature to them and frequency, and each one had a reference code. And those reference codes were specific to those devices, but they were all held in two places, one by the manufacturer and one in the uh, practitioner who was um, providing the, the installation, if you'd like to call it that, of these uh, devices. And then you had a person who got hold of both sets of codes and the special data. So they could go and they could ransom Brad and they could say to Brad, you need to pay me what I'm asking for, do what I'm asking for. Otherwise I'm going to disrupt your electronic device. So part of how that's protected is your responsibility. And then there's the issues on how you store and transmit your, your, your patient and, and client data, not only in terms of your professional um, purposes, but also for referrals and the generation of reports. So there's a lot that goes into this. So when we talk about social media, we talk about it on this multi-layered approach. So hopefully all of you are nodding because you say, yeah, we know how we should behave to each other. We know how we should behave to our colleagues. But what we sometimes forget is there is a national patient rights charter that also puts the responsibilities on our patients to behave in a manner appropriate to disclose appropriately, to take the care that you give them and, and, and use it in a way for their betterment. So what are the immediate benefits of social media? Definitely it keeps us updated. I don't know how many of you get regular updates, uh, whether it's on COVID or on communicable diseases or you're doing your clinical CPD or your ethical CPD online like you are tonight, but user-generated content is unlimited at the moment. Um, building professional support networks has been great. Being able to communicate and share health information has been great. And um, those are some of the immediate benefits. I, I, I'd be curious, and I know you can't show me, I would say this if we were in a room, I would say, show me by a show of hands how many of you do it. But I would just assume the fact that you're online um, is suggestive of that. So I use this slide because this is a book that you can buy. Don't film yourself having sex and other legal advice for the age of social media. And it started off as a joke that said, if you don't want pictures of yourself on the internet, don't take pictures of yourself. Nowadays, that's become a lot more complex. If you don't want information about your practice or your behavior in your practice on the internet, don't uh, make it available. Now, one of the challenges that you have, and the reason that I've got Poppy or the Protection of Personal Information Act up there, you'll see that the date is 2013. The implementation date of the full requirements of Poppy came in on the 18th of September 2020, and its full implementation is expected by the 1st of June 2021, in other words, in a very short space of time. But if you are on social media and I'm your patient, and I only disclose a portion of what I wish to disclose to you about my complaint. And then you see something about my health status or something about my lifestyle out on my profiles. 
you are now in a position where you're a little bit conflicted because you've got this information, but it wasn't shared in the healthcare setting or the therapeutic environment. So how do you manage that? How do you bring that up? And how do you, um, I've got a note that says no sound. Can somebody just give me a sense on whether there's sound for everyone else? Sorry, Brad, I was just unmuting myself. I'm hearing you perfectly. Okay, great. So, uh, Lilani, I'm sorry. Um, it, it could be a, a bandwidth issue on your side. Um, but thank you. And, and one of the things is this shows how well we can communicate using chat in real time. Um, so as we go forward, one of the things that came up, and it, it came up recently, we've been doing these talks on social media and informed consent a long time. But a question that was raised recently, and, and, and MJ will look at this and, and, and Jeanette, and they say, hey, you've added the Electronic Communications and Transmissions Act. Because nowadays, anything you send via email is considered to be a valid communication. So the question came up around, can I send my informed consent to somebody and have them sign it digitally and send it back? And would that be considered to be a valid consent? And the answer would be yes. But bear in mind that once it's out there, any communications that you share out there are there. You can't take them back. Because you can't take them back, the implications of what you send out and um, how you then store your communication, both in your electronic medical records and in an encrypted place, become really important. So please bear in mind that everything you do and say is applicable in terms of your conduct. But you're going to potentially find yourself in conflicting situations if your patients are also Facebook friends or social media friends, or you see them doing something on Instagram, which is inconsistent with what they're telling you in the healthcare setting, and it creates a therapeutic conundrum for you. So bear that in mind, because that is part of the social media challenges that you may face. So let's have a look at it. I spoke to you about this briefly, but um, consent in the form of social media now is, is relevant because you need written consent before you publish information, not verbal consent. So if you're going to take information, now what does publish mean? If you put my information as a patient or as a family member of a patient, or information about me that's shared within the therapeutic privilege of the consultation, and you put it onto an SMS or you share it with your medical group, or you share it on a WhatsApp, that's regarded as publishing information. Uh, MediClinic wrote a very interesting article on this recently, which was very relevant on the, on, on, on the use of a WhatsApp group for therapeutic um, collegiality, but the fact that everything you put onto a multiple group is considered to be published. And if you put anything that a person can be identified by, and sometimes that could be a tattoo, it could be a profile of a piece of their face. It could be a specific characteristic of, of, of a limb. You need to bear in mind that you need written consent and that any time that the public has, has access, regardless of whether you believe they can be identified or not, you need that consent and it needs to go into your, your patient file, whether it's an EMR or a, a, a handwritten file, that's up to you. Also recognize that if the patient is under the age of 12, you will need a consent from the parent, from the patient's parent or their guardian. And in the case where the parents are estranged or divorced, the nature of your profession, you may need the written consent of both parents plus the agreement of the minor. And if it's a sexually related uh, issue, or an issue related to reproductive health, and the minor is a, um, a, a woman, a girl, you need that consent from her in writing as well. You also need to make sure, and this is in, 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 in the booklet, section six is three to five, you cannot identify the patient unless the patient has said, I'm giving you express permission in writing that you can use my name, my face, my image, my identifiable features in the following manner only. But you've got to recognize that 
what you do for you, you've got to make sure that whoever's receiving that information acts in the same way. Now, I said to you earlier, I'd, I'd share one of the scary stories. If you have an electronic record system and it's on your mobile device and your mobile device is not encrypted and you lose that device or that device gets stolen and your record system is open, that means every piece of patient information is accessible to whoever's taken your handset. I got a call one day from the police station. Now, can you imagine this? I get a call, I'm head of legal and risk, and I'm working in healthcare, and I'm working with colleagues like you, and I'm seeing patients, and the call says, this is inspector so-and-so, I'm looking to speak to Dr. Byron. Imagine if that was the call that came into you, how would you feel the first second you heard that call? So I take a big breath, I you know, need some sedatives, I use the AED to restart my heart, and I say, okay, this is me, what do you need? They say, no, doc, listen, sorry to bother you, but we've got this mobile phone that, that um, one of our officers uh, caught off, off, off one of the criminals, and when we opened it up, yours was the last number dialed, so we called you, and there's a whole lot of personal information about a whole lot of patients. That's reality. And if that's you and a patient has harm as a consequence of you sharing that, there's a liability to that that's best avoided. So we'll, we'll come to how to avoid that liability, but I'm sharing that with you so that you're aware. So information sharing is important. We use it for health matters, but we've got to make sure that there's no defamation, there's no hate speech, and there's no copyright in what we share. Sometimes we cut and paste different pieces and we share it along. You also should have specific disclaimers in your social media profiles, stating that these are your views and your views alone, or that the views that you're publishing, where you're accrediting or acknowledging the view, is the view of that representative and it's not necessarily your view. Understand that just because you say that doesn't mean it's going to absolve you from accountability, but you need to make sure that whatever platforms you're using have some form of limitation of liability and some form of discounting what, you, what you're putting up. Otherwise, you find yourself inadvertently dis, um, enforcing or encouraging or endorsing something that you don't necessarily believe in. So let's talk about a social consultation. So I get this comes through the other day and you can see that there's a, a plane from x-ray with some beautiful consolidation, which is actually the trees in the background, because this is a photograph uh, of uh, a plane from x-ray taken through the car window in a parking lot. And the patient says, what do you think? Do I need care and what should I do? And if you look at it, you look at the AC joint, the acrom acromioclavicular joint, then you think, well, that could be something significant, whereas it's actually a, a, a type one subluxation. It's, it's very, very slight but the angle is caught in a specific way. Now, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, but the minute you've read it and there's blue ticks on your WhatsApp, you're in a therapeutic relationship for that question. It takes you to that old joke, and I'm sure many of you have heard it, of the doctor who's at a party and he's talking or she's talking to a friend of theirs who's an attorney, and the doctor says to the attorney, so frustrating coming to these parties because everyone asks me advice. What do you do when people ask you advice? And the attorney smiles and says to the doctor, well, I send them a bill the next day. And the next day the doctor got their bill. You've got to bear in mind that a friend is only a friend until they have an adverse outcome. And so how you set up your social consultation framework, how you record it, how you inform the person that this is now a therapeutic relationship, how you govern um, your engagement becomes really, really important. So in my case, in both of these cases, I would say to the person, I don't know what to think because it's really hard to examine you in this position. I can't see whether you've got um, real harm done or whether you've been compromised. I can't see what's wrong with that ankle. Do you need care? If you severely uncomfortable or if you've got any dysfunction, you need to go to the emergency room or somewhere close to you to examine. And then you need to record consultation. WhatsApp. In your conversation with them and then put it into the medical. 
one of the, the favorite sayings of an advocate of mine is, is they say, you remember that patient that we're talking about? And the practitioner invariably says, yes. <laughs> and they say, well, what socks were you wearing eight weeks ago on Wednesday? You know, I can't remember. They say, well, if you can't remember your socks from eight weeks ago, how can you remember your patient from three years ago? And that specific consultation. So you need to bear in mind that all consultations in terms of the requirements, not only of the uh, National Health Act, but also your registration, require you to take contemporaneous notes. Now, how you take those notes and what, what um, abbreviations you use are up to you, but those notes are important and you need to, to be mindful of that. You also need to be mindful of what you share. So disclosure, which is key in the National Health Act, and it's contained um, not only in, in booklet six, uh, 16, but also in, in booklets five and booklets nine uh, of the ethical guidelines mean that you need to understand that the information that's given to you is given to you in confidence and what you share with them, them being your colleagues or whoever else you're doing this with, they need to treat with confidence and they need to treat with respect. Now, many of you, as I have, have been in sessions where we've gone in and done an m, &M meeting, a, a, a morbidity and mortality meeting, or we've done a clinical updates meeting where somebody's put an image up and they do a case history and they tell you the therapeutic journey of, of that patient. With the patient's name either on the image or they say this was Brad, a 50-year-old um, Caucasian who lives in Cape Town and does nothing all day. Whatever they, they, they're saying nowadays, you've got to make sure that when you say that, Firstly, you've got the permission of the patient before you share the case with them. And secondly, you've got consensus amongst your colleagues that they will not use that information inappropriately. Because often I've seen a colleague take a photograph of an image that's put up. Now you can't control what they do with that image. They might know that person. They may use that image for something entirely different. So you need to make sure on social media that you use the minimum information necessary and take the maximum steps to protect the rights of the patient. And one of those rights is the rights to privacy. So you need to be aware, even if your information is um, in an invisible group, it's just me and my three colleagues in the practice. Well, it's only you and them until their son or their daughter uses their phone or until their phone is paired to their laptop and their laptop is in, in, in the front office. So be aware that the ability to, to share information has grown in ways that we often don't think about. So if, if, if you're in your practice and your phone is there and you leave the room for any reason, who's to say that somebody else isn't reading it? If you using your WhatsApp, and I use that as the example, and there's a QR code that WhatsApp can, can go onto the web and you're using uh, a Microsoft family package and your, your kids are on that package, or your spouse is on that package, or a person you're in a long-term relationship is on that package, the risk of somebody else seeing your private patient information is very real. We spoke about this earlier, but I, I do want to revisit this and say the patient-practitioner relationship is brittle on a healthy day when we look at it in terms of social media. And the reason that I say it's brittle on a healthy day is because the boundaries in the professional practitioner patient relationship get blurry really fast. And media makes that even quicker. You may find that um, some of your patients come in because of a shared um, experience. You might go to the same religious group. You might go to the same sporting group. You might shop in the same shopping center. Your kids might go to the same school. And whichever one of those might be, you might find photos of yourself being used in a manner that you wouldn't necessarily want you to be recruiting patients through that way. So bear that in mind. Also, don't interact with patients via social media platforms, except to be fair, those where you have complete control. So we spoke about social media platforms and I used the distinction between a Facebook platform and a WhatsApp or a LinkedIn platform. I spoke to a group of, of, of um, pediatric surgeons a little while ago. In fact, it was one of my last face-to-face -face presentations. What I particularly liked about um, the presentation is they had a charity that they were supporting called Surgeons for Little Lives. 
And um, that I remember it, I also remember it because it was at Wits and, and I did some of my early undergraduate work at Wits. But what struck me there was there was a clinician who said, you know, I get calls from all over the world. And this was somebody who wrote to me on LinkedIn. And they said, this is the issue that I have with my child. And this is what I think is wrong. And these are the doctors that they've been to see and no one's helping me. And I'm reaching out to you. Please, will you help me? Now, this, this practitioner said, well, what should they do? Because if they don't respond, the next email says, why haven't you responded to me? Don't you care? Or because you didn't respond to me, my child uh, decompensated and they got worse or they ended up in hospital or worse, they died. And how does one respond to that? That is an unsolicited connection via social media. And in this case, via LinkedIn. So this is, this is a, a response that some of you may have, have had to address. And the answer to that is, this is a social media platform. It is not a therapeutic environment. Should you wish to make an appointment with me to do A, B, C, D, or E, here is my contact details. Please follow the following process. Now, my question to you is we self-reflect a little bit because we, we're, we're winding up. So I don't know if, if any of you are counting the minutes like I do, but at the moment it is around 12 minutes to seven, give or take a moment. The issue is this, do you have scripted responses so that you don't have to think under pressure? Have you got a response standard for a social media uh, request that comes to you sometimes in a public forum? You may have a, a Facebook forum, you may have a Instagram forum where somebody writes to you and says, Brad, what should I do about X? If you don't respond to say this is not a therapeutic space, you've essentially created a therapeutic contract by, by behavior where you've committed to help that patient. And, and so how you wind that back is going to be really important for you. So that's number one. Number two is the other ethical dilemmas that you can have is you may combine your personal relationship with the patient with your clinical relationship with that patient. And you may do it on the same platform. Now, whilst it's not common, it's not uncommon that a patient who is also a friend has an adverse outcome that materially affects their lives or they perceive that that is the case. It doesn't have to be the case. They only have to perceive it. If they do perceive it and, and, and they push back at you against this, then they may give your entire transcript that they've kept on WhatsApp or whichever group you're using to their attorney and say, look at how blurry this relationship is. And of course, the attorney uses that to their advantage to say, well, Brad behaved rather unethically. This is not good behavior. We can hold him here, here, and here on his ethical behaviors, not to mention his clinical behaviors. And that's why managing your social media relationships are really, really important. Things that we, 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 we weren't taught and we haven't thought about. And so I'm going to suggest to you that you learn to set boundaries then accept in an emergency or a life-threatening situation. If a patient is seeking healthcare advice over social media, you should request them to set up an appointment in person. Now, COVID's changed these rules profoundly. I remember my last pre-lockdown day, I did a, a, a lecture on, on, on medical errors and social media risks in the morning. I then went and met with Sama and had some conversations with them um, on, on other issues. And then I spoke at the Medical Legal Association on some of their issues. It was a busy day for me. It was the last day that I had a major delegation of people in front of me where we could have face-to-face -face conversation and share. A month after that, the requirements on telemedicine were brought in to allow for telehealth. Now, we live in a world where telehealth is a reality, but with telehealth comes social media risk. So whilst the booklet, section 7.7 .7 to 7.9, speaks about appointment in person, where you cannot have a point in person. Please make sure that you keep a log of all your contents and transfer everything that you do on a telehealth basis into your permanent record. So a lot of times we don't. 
And a lot of people I speak to, they say, Gee, it's so hard to do a record. And do I have to keep this? And what happens if I don't? Do you have the, the, the bottom line is you need to. You're obligated to yeah, keep uh, it. Uh, the, uh, the parking lot. Yeah. Guys, uh, you uh, uh, are unmuted uh, and we can hear you. So I remember going to a wedding once and we could hear this, the, the sermon from across the road from the other church. So every now and then you'll hear overlap and it's the same in, in, in these kind of uh, social media conversations. So my recommendation to use this as we wind up, there's a couple more slides. Uh, there's a health and safety strategy used by many companies now called the Stop, Think, Act policy. So when you need to post something, stop, think, do I have consent from the patient? Is it written? Am I sharing this on a platform that's appropriate? And are the people who are receiving it appropriately aware of how they need to behave? Because even with a pseudonym, you cannot guarantee anonymity on a social media platform. We can trace you through linked accounts. Um, criminals can, can trace you through phishing and IP address issues. So err on the side of caution. When in doubt about whether you should ethically or legally do it, get advice. So stop. Stop is pause. Think is get advice and then act. There's nothing wrong with getting advice. And except in a life-threatening situation where emergency intervention is needed, where a good Samaritan act or a life-saving act is done, there's always time to think. So there are um, hidden dangers, spam accounts, people looking to get your information, social networking, profiling and identity theft, and networking sites to target vacant homes. So sometimes people have a um, electronic uh, booking system. I go online and I see you blocked off for a week. I can't book. I know you're not in the practice. Well, that might mean no one else is in the practice and I, I could come and look to see what um, pharmaceuticals you've got in your drawer. So bear in mind that there's always that risk. And with that risk, you need to uh, be extra vigilant. Also, follow this. And, and I'm going to ask you, how often do you change your password? Is your password your street address? Is your password your birthday? Is your password your telephone number? If it is, you need to change it. So you also need to change your password frequently. You need to be aware of what you share and with whom, because everything that you share can be collected so that people can profile you. Are your privacy settings on your browser as strong as they should be, or on your uh, Microsoft or Apple or Android system? Are you using um, two-factor authentication, password and fingerprint or password and telephone number? Avoid clicking on links and apps that you don't know. And don't make friends with people you don't know because often those people are there to try and get your information. Um, so we, we're coming up to question time in, in one or two moments. So advice. What you share, taking a lesson out of um, Professor Noakes' um, statements, and, and many of you will be aware of this, so there's a difference between spreading scientific information and giving medical advice. But it doesn't matter because the interpretation of what you share, once it goes into social media, is no longer under your control. So even if health advice is evidence-based, it's scientifically sound and it's generic, you may have a person who reads that the way that they wish to read it. So the ethical guidelines give you some, some very specific advice evidence-based, scientifically sound, generic, and um, that the person receiving it needs to consult. Now, ivermectin is a great example of how we are arguing around a therapy with an off-label medicine that does or doesn't work, that does or doesn't have other pharmaceutically active ingredients, that does or doesn't have physiological effects. Now, I'm not giving an opinion on that, but I read a lot of opinion on that. And the world is very divided. Now, how does one give evidence-based and scientifically sound advice on a new vaccination or on an off-label use of a medicine? It's difficult, and so you need to decide for yourself how and where you wish to weigh into a debate. You also need to recognize that your professional and your personal persona are separate, and so you may want to create separate social media accounts to represent those relationships. 
You can choose what to share about yourself during a face-to-face -face consultation, but you don't have the same level of privacy or discretion when you're on social media. So where you're performing those non-medical roles and ask yourself where you are, are you maintaining ad adequate and appropriate boundaries? Because they may be difficult to unwind later on. Have you considered the circumstances that will happen and the implications if you accept a request from somebody that leads to an untoward and unfortunate outcome? And understand, just because you know this doesn't mean that you're not held accountable to the rules. So the rules are there and the rules won't change. How we address those rules is important. And at this point, we're three or four minutes to go before the end of, of the hour. So I want to thank you all very much for listening. Um, for those of you that had sound problems, I do apologize. It's, it's always difficult. And um, Jeanette, to yourself and Peter and, and Michael, John, I'm going to hand back to you to answer any questions that you've got. And Thank you, Brad, for, for, a, for a most informative talk, as always. I'm sure that the practitioners have, um, have really enjoyed it. For those of the eagle eyes in the room uh, who can see that my background <laughs> seems to have changed, I've uh, been skulking around my own house trying to avoid my twins who have uh, eagerly been trying to listen in while Dad's been uh, attending the CPD event. So um, now's a, an opportunity for you to raise um, some questions uh, for Brad, should anyone have them. Um, I've put it in the chat bar, but um, to unmute yourselves, please, would you just hold down your space bar? Alternatively, uh, select unmute. Uh, I've, I've enabled the ability to do that under the chat function, so you can either unmute yourself as well. Uh, we'll give everyone a couple minutes now just to, um, to, to raise any questions you may have. Um, uh, so with that said, over to the floor. And of course, if you don't want to speak, you can just type a question. Absolutely. In this day and age, I think uh, sometimes that's even easier. Huh? But uh, yeah, for sure. So please use the chat bar if you would like to type, type a message through. MJ, we must just please uh, allow um, uh, Shanaz just to close off uh, before everyone logs off, please. Absolutely, we'll do that. Um, also, Thank please you. be advised that uh, for those of you who would like to access the presentation um, via Jeanette and the, and the team at Indware, we will send a link to the presentation once it's been loaded onto the Genoa YouTube channel. So, so the question that's come through is, aside from social media liability exposures, does greater connectivity increase cyber exposure? Sadly, yes. Because what is a cyber exposure? A cyber exposure is the exposure to your digital information via your storage and or your devices. So the more devices you have, the more you store, the greater your, your vulnerability because you're vulnerable to your internet service provider. You're vulnerable to the network that you've created. And then you're vulnerable to also the programs that, that, that you use. So if you're using an electronic medical record system, you're vulnerable to the administrator of that mm. system. If you're using a HIMSS, a hospital information management system, you're vulnerable to them. If you're using an app, you're vulnerable to, to that app and the users of that app. The flip side of that, and, and this is what one needs to be aware of, is sometimes there is a, a cyber risk where information is stolen but until that information is acted on, it's not regarded as being exposed. So my answer to you is, yes, you have increased cyber exposure. And yes, you should be exploring and understanding this, especially in this digitized world. Fantastic. Um, we'll just give a, about another 20 seconds, Jeanette, and then we'll hand over to Shanaz just to, to wrap up, if you are happy with that. Yes, thank you very much. And I'll be sending you a high-level overview and um, your certificates. And you'll have a, um, an insight and a checklist and a fact sheet with all relevant information on Genoa Medical Malpractice. And thank you for your attendance this evening. Thanks, Shanaz. So I think with that said, um, uh, over to you. Oh, wait, we've got another question. There's Here a question. Yeah. Okay, Are so you exposed? Are you exposed to uploading and downloading patient info to medical aids using devices if someone hacks the device? Well, there's a couple of things one needs to be aware of. 
when you get your consent with your patient, part of that consent is the sharing of information with third party payers, including the ICD-10 code and the procedure code. So your diagnostic code and the procedures, they've given you consent to share. If you have not taken reasonable precaution on securing your devices with um, two-factor authentication and other things, and you've got a smart hacker, well, then the fault is not yours. But if you haven't taken the precautions, then the fault is yours. So by way of an extension of this, I have the pleasure of, of, of chairing a board called Safe Surgery South Africa. We're very excited and very sad because our technology guy, who's an absolute rock star, just joined a company as a professional hacker. His job is to work to hack their systems so that they can make sure their systems are strong. And so technology companies now do that. You can't be expected to try and hack your own system to see if it's secure. So as long as you've been shown to be diligent in and uploading and downloading your information and you're not doing it in a coffee shop, I don't see that to be uh, a significant problem. Uh, is, is this particular Vula app safe to share patients' information? I do not know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Maybe someone else does. Thank you.